From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Believe it or not, Rhode Island's job market was worse than everyone thought it was last year. Revised data from the Department of Labor and Training reveals our unemployment rate was a depressing 11% in 2011. Why is the ocean state stuck in the sand when the rest of the country seems to be moving on? Plus, should the rich pay more in income tax and how do you define rich? Also, municipal pension reform, casino gambling, and Providence bankruptcy. A packed agenda for our guest this week on Newsmakers, President of the Rhode Island Senate, Teresa Piva-Weed. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and Eyewitness News analyst Arlene Violet. Good morning, everyone. Madam President, thank you so much for joining Welcome. us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Um, let's start with those depressing unemployment numbers. Um, the Senate has proposed a packet of bills that you tout as a way to streamline doing business in Rhode Island, which I'm sure you want to discuss. But Rhode Island is behind the rest of the country in recovery. Uh, we started losing jobs in, in January 2007. You almost want to joke with these bills, you know, gee, what's the rush? Um, where has that sense of urgency been, that attitude over the last five years, you could even argue 10 years? Well, certainly uh, in the past few years, and as I sit here today, uh, improving Rhode Island's unemployment, improve, increasing jobs in Rhode Island is and remains a Senate priority. Over the past few years, we've had a number of packages that look at making it easier for us to do business here in Rhode Island. Uh, we continue with that package and looking at things like making it easier to, uh, for businesses to address concerns regarding fire code changes, working together with the fire marshal, which is one of the big things we've heard. But it, is, it takes time. These, uh, these problems and structural problems in our state didn't arise overnight. So, for example, we've had a major structural change in our income tax, lowering the lowest bracket. We've done, taken a number of initiatives to cut red tape, but it takes time for that word to get out in the business community and around the country uh, that we are open to business. We've also resisted a lot of changes that would have had a negative impact in our economy. Uh, however, a lot of what happens in Rhode Island, quite honestly, is controlled by what happens outside our very own borders. And so we are constantly need to be on guard and be careful. Uh, we've lost some population. A uh, priority of the Senate, a priority for me, has been workforce development. We've actually redefined in statute over the past couple of years uh, CCRI's uh, goals in terms of workforce development. We've been working with higher ed leaders to urge them uh, to work with business to determine what the needs are for both training and education rather than, as you know, days gone by, you just went to college, got a degree. That and then went and looked for a job. Now what we need is business coming to our higher education facilities and saying these are the areas where we need uh, workforce development. Uh, um, let me ask you specifically, uh, in that packet of bills, a lot of those came out of the SBA summit. Correct. Um, I'm curious about one uh, not, that's not in, in that packet. We're the only state in the country that requires businesses to pay on a weekly basis. The SBA estimates that we could save small businesses $16 million doing away with that requirement. Why isn't it in there? Um, certainly we have talked about it. Um, it has been introduced. I'm not sure which list it's not on, but Senator Walosk, I believe, Would you support has away introduced with it? it. We're working together with the businesses in the community uh, to determine whether or not um, there is a way we can address the concerns well, the that some will folks it weekly, did. right? I mean, they want a actually, weekly. It's, it's it's, a, it's, a so, isn't it? Isn't that a stop to the unions? And that's why it's not biweekly. Lower paid wage earners are affected by it, as you know. We have a problem or concerns that are constantly raised about payday lending and cash checking because a lot of people do leave, live week to week. I think over time what has happened is the savings have accrued on it because of the bigger companies. It's easier for them to, in fact, uh, payroll folks. But if you look at other areas, 
Uh, sometimes if you people don't get paid one week, the next week in a small business, the paycheck's not there. But also, people live paycheck to paycheck if they're in low income. One thing I'd point out, in a lot of states, while they have biweekly, that doesn't mean that everybody is paid biweekly. And what we've been talking about in the Senate is how do you strike that balance where you protect the lower paid wage earners um, and then yet let the fidelities of the world or the CVSs of the world, the big corporates for whom this is an issue, be able to... But you uh, talked about open for business. I mean, only state in the country. Isn't that saying in, in some ways we're closed we for business? It's something we need to address this year. We, okay. need, we are definitely... Senator Walaska has put it on and it's on the table. The SBA has said it's become an issue uh, and we have definitely been having conversations. But I don't want you to think we're not addressing okay. it. Um, and once again, the state, I'd just like to point out the irony of the union's uh, issue. The state of Rhode Island pays bi-weekly. Right. Most <laughs> governments pay bi-weekly. So it, it's not something that people are not necessarily, you know, people are used to it in some fashion. The concern becomes the smaller, the lower paid employees who quite honestly live paycheck to paycheck. I know, um, you know, this question's coming and I know you believe strongly in letting the Finance Committee do its work before taking positions on, mm -hmm. on budget issues, but I have to ask, what do you think of the very high profile proposals to raise the income tax on Rhode Islanders who make $250,000 or more? What, what do you think of that idea? I oppose that idea. Um, we very, have, that's very clear. Then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, taken uh, very significant steps in the area of tax reform uh, in 2010 that are just being implemented now. The one thing we know about business is that they look for stability in taxation, which is why I answer you without hesitation. That we need to see the implementation of the tax reforms that we have made and how they are going to affect our revenues, how they affect the economy. They've been recognized um, around the country by various groups as being very progressive. And once again, we were trying to address perce perception because as I said, a lot of what happens in uh, Rhode Island is based upon what's going on around us. And our, tax, our highest tax rate was high. We looked at the flat tax, we had taken different steps, but now with reducing that highest rate, we're hoping that when a business is looking at that list of things they look at, quality of life, workforce, uh, cost of property taxes, that the income tax now, that's one more thing on the checklist. Governor uh, Chafee supports uh, helping Providence out of its fiscal uh, mess. Uh, do you think that that's an enabling uh, kind of position where uh, retirees won't uh, take the hits or give up on colas as long as they think the rest of the state's going to bail them out? And what does Providence have to show you uh, before you would agree to any type of bailout? Let me say this. Mayor uh, Tavares has shown incredible leadership over the past year. And it's been a real honor to work together with him, Speaker Fox, Chairwoman Mary Ellen Goodwin, who's chair of the Providence Caucus and Leader Ruggiero in particular, as well as both caucuses in the House and Senate. We passed, uh, last year, we gave them tremendous support. What my focus has always been is looking at methods of support that help all of our cities and towns. Uh, for example, there was uh, additional funds put into the pilot, $5 million, which helped every community that has either a college or a private college or a hospital uh, that is tax exempt. But when we put $5 million additional money in the legislature into it, Providence gets over $3 million of that. Uh, that's just an example. There was fire hydrant legislation. Yeah, okay, but, but what do you do? I mean, on the table is help us out, give us money. What does Providence have to do before you uh, direct any funds? Are you, are you trying to say you won't do it unless uh, everyone we've, shares? We've been doing it for this, this past year. Uh, if you're asking, are we just going to write a check directly to Providence? No. And I said that, that with regard it, to central funds. Is, is that a bad enabler if you yes. were to do oh, that? Ab so yeah. did, is Mr. Chafee's because proposal too much of an enabling the I'm wrong way? I'm not sure which specific proposal, Arlene, uh, that you'd be referring to, but I certainly support additional 
funds through pilot for Providence. I certainly support pilots, work. Pilots, we should just say to people, those I'm sorry, are that payment, payment in lieu of taxes for tax exempt. I, I've demonstrated yeah. that last year, and I would go yeah, forward Yeah, but that's, this that's year. not going to solve the problem, though. You know, he thinks the retirees have to give up, uh, uh, you know, the coal is, et cetera. Do you think the retirees, given the situation in Providence, should uh, temporarily forego coal is? I'm hoping he has a town hall meeting planned. Yeah, but what um, do you think? I think they should, uh, the higher ones, certainly, the, the, he has the a unique five situation, there's 5 and 6% right. compounded colas that there is a handful of retirees that are receiving. I think that they <laughs> should <be> step <laughs> forward and, in fact, give up those colas uh, and bear their share. Whether or not they're willing to do that, whether he's able to secure that, I'm not sure, but I absolutely believe they need to do their fair share, and particularly when you look at the high salaries that they're giving. So let me, uh, since we're but talking... But that needs to be done either contractually, because there's a Supreme Court case and a consent judgment they, that was signed by the city. It's so that needs to be done con contractually. Is that... Uh, we're it not going to do anything legislatively. Is that what you're saying? I'll, I will not say that we will not do anything legislatively because there may come a time when we have to look at uh, Providence-only legislation. If so you're council sometimes caricatured as not thinking there should be any legislation. It sounds like there's more wiggle room. You, you are open to it depending on the city. What I've always said about municipal pensions is city by city, town by town. Um, we have not received a council resolution from the city of Providence asking for that type of enabling legislation. I don't think that type of enabling legislation would solve the problem only based upon we passed very difficult legislation last session for the Medicare um, changeover in the retirees which would have saved millions of dollars not just for Providence but for all the cities and towns and that has currently uh, in Challenge. Sarah Taft Carter, Judge Sarah Taft Carter has issued an injunctive relief, uh, restrain the city from proceeding with that change. My thought process is that is a longer term discussion because I have no reason to believe that another piece of enabling legislation wouldn't reach the same result. Uh, that's why I really believe they need to sit down, negotiate it, talk about it, and if those Providence firemen really care about that city that are receiving those big pensions and those big colas. I have to believe that they're going to come forward uh, at the town hall meeting and help. And maybe it won't you, be giving you, up you their really colas. You really think they're going to? I want to believe that. I, I have not received those signs one way or the other. But I want to believe that if they really care about the city of Providence um, and that they are going to want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Can I ask you uh, about the Ethics Commission? I heard you talking to Ian Donis, our colleague, uh, on the radio yesterday, and you said um, you want to find a way to balance the speech and debate clause of the Constitution. We don't have enough time to get into all of it. People <laughs> can Google that if they want to find out what it means. But um, I know, as I understand the Irons decision, which is the Supreme Court decision that, that took away the Ethics Commission's jurisdiction over lawmakers, the speech and debate clause is kind of the whole problem. So how can you balance uh, what would be a solution that maintains speech and debate while also giving the Ethics Commission police powers over the lawmakers, or is, is that sort of a way to punt? It's certainly not a way to punt. And boy, this is a hard one in a 30 but it's seconds or so less. Please. Yeah, please. But yeah. as you know, the federal constitution embraces separation of powers and speech and debate. When we enacted separation of powers, we also embraced, um, we now are in a new era. It is unclear whether the Ethics Commission is subject to separation of powers. That's one very big issue that is out there. And I don't believe, uh, this is a structural issue for government for the next 100 years. This isn't about me or about anybody who's sitting right now. You could, in fact, we have already have one of the strongest ethics commissions in the country. On everyone but the lawmakers. Right. <laughs> on the, that, and just so we're clear, so the listening public doesn't get cynical, mm -hmm. on lawmakers in their voting capacity. Mm -hmm. I, um, that's, I mean, that is a, a very important issue, which is protected as it is with our U.S. senators and our U.S. congressmen, as created but the votes are by where the our bread and butter on. I mean, that's that's. Uh, can I finish? Uh, okay. Please. That that what the problem becomes, you could have an ethics commission appointed mm -hmm. by the governor, mm -hmm. with complete control over legislative votes, and I'm concerned about that for the long term. 
Um, the governor right now appoints from lists that are submitted by the General Assembly. And there is a question whether or not that is constitutional or not constitutional. So what do you do then about the legislators who allegedly that, get to write Blue Cross, Blue Shield uh, I think contracts, that's the issue. Uh, and, and then they vote uh, or they go to work for a hospital, etc. You cetera, can do it statutorily. You can do it statutorily. You don't have to eliminate the speech and debate But that clause. does mean lawmakers and policing legislation themselves. In? Is the legislation in? Did you there put have, any in? There has been meetings going on. The other thing you could do... So that's do, a no. There's nothing pending now, right? But I don't want... Your vote we've on. been meeting. I've met twice with Senator Sheehan. There is nothing pending now. Senator O'Neill has put in the original bill as a template, as a placeholder. Mm -hmm. But the issue becomes they still would have rulemaking authority. Arlene, I know you're a, bio, uh, a lawyer. We, we're going to now have a body that's executive and legislative and controls the vote of the legislative body. And that really does right. concern me. Right. So it, there was a proposed um, compromise at one point which would have eliminated the rulemaking authority of the Ethics Commission. Uh, that was not acceptable. Another proposal of, that folks were, which would then go to the people for a vote, would be to do this by statute. That being said, I want everyone to know that the kind of behavior that you just talked about is also always subject, as you know, to criminal charges. Je the, there's ethics commission and then there's criminal charges. Anybody who behaves or votes or acts in any capacity, be it legislative or otherwise, in violation of the law, is always subject to the jurisdiction of the state laws. We are way overdue <laughs> for a break, so we're going <laughs> to pause the conversation right now. Our guest this week is Senate President Teresa Piper. We, you're watching Newsmakers. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, Arlene Violet and Ted Nisi. And our guest this week is Senate President Teresa Piva Weed. Uh, Madam President, we're reading a lot of the headlines on the state police investigation into the International Sports Inst Institute. Serious questions over finances there, and especially a $575,000 legislative grant. And that's what I want to discuss right now. Just in the last fiscal year, uh, you personally handed out 17 legislative grants totaling $58,000, including, for example, a $2,500 legislative grant to the Newport Rugby Football Club. Who decides which grants are allocated? The grants are allocated um, by the JCLS, theoretically, that they're part Which of the, the legislative joint committee budget of legislative services. Right, there it comes under the joint committee. But they, that many mean of though, them, right? many of them are listed in the budget um, as line items, such as the International Sports Institute. I believe I don't. I shouldn't say that. I've never checked that, um, and I don't want to get political facted. But a number of them go through the departments. Uh, and then are handed out that way. Uh, in our chamber, years ago, they were very political. Every, you know, it was all about who leadership or not leadership. Now everybody is eligible. Last year there was, uh, in the years before, every community gets them. They go to senior centers. They go to local uh, youth organizations that are doing good things. They help nonprofits. Sometimes they're one time only. Uh, CAP agencies receive them. Our, our local East Bay uh, Molar Express receives them. Oftentimes uh, they are matches with other funds uh, that are coming forward. Uh, so I think they're all posted online, which is really important to mention. And when Mike Lenningham was chair of finance, he started a great program on the Senate, which requires an application that goes out comes back, they have to return all of the receipts, it's itemized, everything's accounted for, there's certain things that they cannot expend them for or spend those funds for. You know, it, we're not talking about a small amount of money here. We have totaling $2 million of legislative grants, $7 million for community service grants, that's $9 million. A review in the past five years of the JCLS transcripts show not once was there a vote on any of these. Why aren't there actual votes on spending taxpayer dollars? Well, I would suggest to you um, that the vote is for for a huge, for a significant number of those, they are in the budget. A significant number go through the various departments. Um, I'm trying to think for uh, some of them go through the Department of Human Services um, if they're human services related. That a lot of those programmatic grants developed over time 
the only analogy I can think of is it became like school committees cutting sports. Uh, for example, when I first came, the school breakfast program was part of the legislative grant process because there was this tension between the executive branch and the legislative branch. The executive branch is told to cut their budget, and what happens is they cut the things that the legislative branch they know will restore. That's how a lot of it started. Some of it is also part of water fires is in there. Um, there so what you're saying is though, variety. on the Senate side, you do have accountability because they continue to send receipts back so you know the money is actually spent. Of course, in the House, $575,000, which is a House-related uh, grant by Gordon Fox, are, are you saying they don't have an accountability system that no receipts no, are I sent believe, back I believe over there? they do. I, I want to say this grant preceded the current URI um, President Dave Dooley and uh, Speaker Fox and myself. But do you know Fox for a fact receipts go back to the House side to prove that uh, you know people didn't take a vacation with the ten thousand that they were given? I mean, it looks good. It's for little kids, senior citizens. But how as do you, far as I how know, the House accounts for all their grants. I, my primary responsibility is the Senate. Yes, but, but as far as the International Institute, what the audit said is they only received receipts for um, that was, I believe, two hundred thousand from the uh -huh. Senate side and three hundred and seventy-five thousand from the House side. Speaker Fox was not the chair of JCLS, nor was I the Senate president at that time. And it went through URI. And as we know, a number of philanthropists and a lot of federal money also was given to the Institute. It appears uh, that the University of Rhode Island uh, had uh, an unusual relationship with the Institute. And uh, it, I'm confident that it you know, a complete, the mat, I'm confident in Speaker Fox's handling of the matter. Uh, he has kept me informed, and I'm hopeful that uh, the whole issue will be resolved shortly. So taxpayers, though, for the future, now in the future, should have confidence that those of you in the General Assembly have accountability because you're getting receipts from these folks that you give the grants to. Is Absolute that correct? Absolute accountability. Okay. And I want to say, once again, we were talking a little bit about the age of computers. Every grant is online. Not that sure. there is nothing secret anymore, which is a huge difference. So you can go online and you can see just what grants people are giving. And, and we love transparency in the media, that's for sure. I, just philosophically, and we can wrap this conversation up, but you know, I, philanthropy is a good thing. Um, you talk about senior centers, and I brought up the rugby club. Um, you know, but in a time of austerity, should taxpayers? be on the hook for giving out to charities or giving out to these groups and organizations when they might not have a good grasp on who gets them? I mean, Nine million dollars, it's not a small amount. Yes, because the organizations for the most part tend to be not-for-profit organizations that are performing functions that would otherwise be left to government. Most of them are not-for-profits, they're food pantries, they're uh, groups that are involved in some way uh, with a partnership in some form, oftentimes federal or state government, and many of the grants are very small um, grants. But, but they add up. The small ones, but the big ones that get to that number are the ones I'm referring to. The others are small grants, which are supporting little leagues, are supporting senior centers, are supporting food pantries. And I believe as long as they're accountable and transparent, um, that uh, is the single most important thing. I'm curious about uh, someone whose name comes up a lot, uh, often in Ed Acorn's column, who I'm sure is your favorite writer at the <laughs> Providence Journal, uh, Senate Majority Leader Don Ruggiero. He's a high-placed official in the Laborers Union, and there's this perception you constantly hear that he calls all the shots in the Senate, that he tells you what you're going to do, and you do it, and then it's done. How would you describe his influence? <laughs> I think Senator Ruggiero is a terrific leader. He is, um, we have had worked together for 20 years. We worked together on finance committee. I uh, was the um, majority leader, he was the whip, and now he is in a position where he has demonstrated, uh, for example, uh, as sponsor of the I-195 legislation, an incredible ability to build consensus and bring people together. I'd also be remiss if I didn't point out there were only three souls that signed onto the pension reform bill. Uh, there wasn't a long list of senators standing behind me. And uh, it was Senator Mary Ellen Goodwin, the Majority Whip, and uh, Lita Ruggiero, 
who were the co-sponsors. And on the House side, as you know, Speaker Fox was the prime. And the leadership he showed in doing that, and he took an awful lot of criticism for doing that, but he believed it was the right thing to do. Um, now I believe a, made right. a difference. Now there's a perception that the unions will get payback. For example, binding arbitration is back on the table again. Uh, there's a thesis about moving the layoff date to we six months. We have about one. a minute, Arlene. Uh, uh, but Ciccone uh, wants to tie that into tenure. Uh, as you look at these issues, per perpetuity contracts and to collective bargaining changes it. Do you, what don't you support relative to those bills? I've always supported changing the layoff date. We've passed it in the past. The unions have actually opposed that. Um, it's a ca case where I believe there's actually kind of a divide, in my opinion, between the members, the teachers, and their leadership. Will you support binding arbitration? Uh, n only the type of bill that we passed last year, uh, first last, uh, best, last best offer legislation, which um, actually provides some kind of arbitration through court appoint court through judges in, in, indefinite not the type of I do not support the type of arbitration which exists for fire indefinite police contracts at this point uh, that legislation if we do the legis if we do, if we address the mediation process or we find some way for contract resolution dis dispute resolution we won't need the other all right madam president we are fresh out of time thank you so much for joining us on the program we had a lot of news this week including a, an exclusive poll if you missed any of it it's on our website wpri.com for ted nisi arlene violet i'm tim white we'll see you next week